Oh, hey, good evening, church. Good to see you. I, hope I see a few jackets out there tonight. Beautiful day the Lord has given us all week. Won't you stand with us as we turn our voices, our minds, and our hearts to our Heavenly Father? What child is this? What child? See you in the sunrise every morning. It's like a picture that you painted for me. A love letter in the sky. Story. I could have had a really different story. But you came down from heaven to restore me, forever save my life. Nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus. I stand in all of your amazing ways. I worship you as long as I God, you pull me through. Nobody loves me like me. Mountain, you're breaking down the weight of all my mind. 
people said amen praise the lord nobody loves us like jesus does and again thank you brother sam and band for leading us in worship and so give them hearts and thumbs up and amens whether you're online or in person again we welcome you if you're a guest with us online first time guest um we just encourage you to text guest to the number 478-242-7200 and all we're asking for is a name and email address. And if you do give us that, we'll donate $5 in honor of you to our local Joy Clinic, which ministers to people in our area that do not have health insurance. And so uh, we do have guests that do watch online with us, just kind of let you know. Um, we even had somebody from Macon watching with us Sunday that filled in a, uh, a guest thing. And so um, you just never know who's, who's watching, and we just want to welcome you. Uh, like I said, let us know who's watching. If you're online, if you have prayer requests, you can put them in the box. If you just want that to be prayed uh, by us as staff, just uh, text pray to that number and it'll give you a form and it'll send, you'll be able to send that in. We'll be praying for you and we'll put that on the prayer list. So if that's what you want. So we're just so glad to have you tonight. Let me just do make uh, a couple announcements. Uh, we will be doing, uh, like I said, Sunday. A drive through probably going to call it a drive through Christmas celebration. And uh, what we're going to do, we asked for people to do trunks, but what we're going to do with the trunks is kind of set up the different scenes. Since we kind of did the nativity last year, we'll kind of do the they'll drive through with the different scenes of the nativity. And then at the very end, over on that side, as they drive through several scenes, at the end will be the nativity. Um, where the gift of God is, and what we'll do is pass out a, you know, uh, a bag of gifts to them at that. So that's kind of what we're going to do. Um, so if you help, sign up, let us know. We're going to need people just directing traffic. We're going to need people to help uh, put stuff in bags because we're going to put candy in there and candy canes. We'll have a coloring book and crayons uh, for the kids and stuff like that so if you can help in any way or if you want say hey i'd like to have a place uh with my car in the scene just let us know uh because that's what we'll be doing any way you can help let us know it's a way to just um share christ uh with our community have we ever done that before no but who cares god will take care of it okay you didn't hear sunday sermon um don't worry about it. 
God can take care of it. And if God doesn't want it to take place, he'll shut it down too. Uh, so let's just trust God, and if you can help in any way, or if it's just to donate candy or candy canes, whatever, anything will be greatly appreciated. That'll be not this Saturday, but next Saturday, 5.30 to 7.30, okay? And so any way you can help, uh, even if you're not a member, you can help, okay? So any way you can help be greatly appreciated. Uh, also, and then students, any of you are online, uh, we are going to the MOVE conference just one day this year, just $15 on the 29th of December. So that's what we got coming up. Let's go, Lord, in prayer, and uh, we'll dive off into Revelation. Dear Heavenly Father, we again thank you and praise you for just another day to experience your grace and mercy and love. Lord, we are again grateful that you love us. And this time of the season just reminds us how much you do love us. <laughs> you left heaven to be born of a virgin to live a perfect life, to go from the cradle to the cross so that you might shed your blood for us so that we might have eternal life. And so, Lord, we are just so grateful for another day. We're grateful for your mercy. We're grateful for your goodness. But, Lord, I do pray for my brothers and sisters, whether they're in person or online, may you be with them. Meet them at their deepest point of need. Whatever requests they have, Lord, if it be your will, I pray you would answer them tonight. If not, give them the grace till you say yes or no. <coughs> Lord, we do pray for our country and our nation, which desperately needs you. Lord, we pray that you just might wake up our nation and we might return to godliness and righteousness instead of sin and corruption and idolatry being what we're known for. Lord, we pray for our leaders. We pray, Lord, you would convict them of their sin. Show them the gospel. And Lord, may they come to a place of repentance and faith. May they realize that the gospel is the real deal. May you pull down the blinders on their eyes and show them the gospel. And Lord, we pray that from present on down to whoever that's serving there in Washington, that they might come to know you. Lord, we do pray for truth to be exalted in this nation and that righteousness would be exalted again. And Lord, again, maybe this Christmas season, Lord, may you use it to draw many, many people to yourself. May people focus on the Christ child and not on all the other stuff. So Lord, guide us tonight. We ask for wisdom and discernment. Your insight as we look at one of the most difficult chapters in the whole book of Revelation. And so Lord, we ask for your guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. You can read it in the Bible, and in the days of Elijah, many people were just going about living as usual, and um, just living the life the way it goes, like many people today, they just go about life, live whatever way they want to do. And when Jesus comes, hey, people are just going to be going about life as usual, and then bang, he, he's going to come. And so tonight we're going to go to Revelation 11, which kind of reminds us kind of of the, the days of Elijah, people just going about doing things the way they used to. Now, some people call this the, maybe the most difficult chapter in Revelation to kind of interpret and know what's going on. So we're going to look at <coughs> not all of it, but the main gist of it. And we're going to look at the temple and the two witnesses. And so let's read uh, verses 1 through 14. And... Uh, John says here, Then I was given a measuring, measuring reed like a rod. With these words, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar, and count those who worship there. 
But exclude the courtyard outside the temple. Don't measure it, because it is given to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy for 1,260 days, which is 42 months or three and a half years, okay? Which is half of seven, okay? And so these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before uh, the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire comes from their mouth. No, not literal fire, okay? And consumes their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. They have authority to close up the sky so that it does not rain during the days of their prophecy. They also have the power over the waters to turn them into blood and strike the earth with every plague whenever they want. And when they finish their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss, which will be the Antichrist, which we've already looked at in Revelation 13, will make war on them, conquer them, and kill them. Their dead bodies will lie in the main street of the great city, which figuratively is called Sodom and Egypt. Here's the clue of where it's at, where also their Lord was crucified. And some of the peoples, tribes, languages, and the nations will view their bodies for three and a half days and not permit their bodies to be put into a tomb. Those who live on the earth will gloat over them and celebrate and send gifts to one another because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet. Great fear fell on all those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. They went up to heaven in a cloud, while their enemies watched them. At that moment, a violent earthquake took place, a tenth of the city fell, and 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. The survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Take note, the third woe is coming soon. Almost like strike one, strike two, you better be ready. Strike three is coming next. And so I think kind of the main thrust of this the, in this text, kind of the take-home truth, and then we'll just kind of try to expose and exegete and look at what's in this text is this. This will be the main truth. The people of God will exist at all times to speak the word of God at all costs. Okay, the people of God, that's Christ followers, will exist at all times to do what? Speak the word of God at all cost. And that's been from the beginning, and it will be to the very last day. Now, the temple and the work of the two witnesses Many view this as symbolic or figurative language. They would say the temple and the holy city represent the new people of God in the church. Some believe that the two witnesses there uh, are the churches boldly proclaiming the truth of God's word. When they're resurrected, many believe that's the rapture. And that would be the mid-tribulation people, okay? Many believe that pre-trib, hey, 1 Thessalonians 4, at the beginning of the tribulation time, the church will be raptured out. Many hold mid-tribulation. They would say the first three and a half years while this preaching is going on, there'll be a revival, things will be going and happening evil fast, and then all of a sudden, bam, is where it come up here they would say hey that's the tribulation church and then post-tribulation people would say hey rapture second coming like we saw in revelation 19 are the same thing now i disagree with that basically because when jesus comes in revelation 19 it's on a white horse 
1 Thessalonians 4, we meet him in the air. So that's why I think that's, I don't hold to that. Now, you can be good and godly there. I know good and godly people on all, all of those, okay? So you got to figure out the main thing, Jesus is coming. Are you ready? Um, where you fall out, you just need to figure it out and, and know, hey, this is why I believe this, because I see this in the Word. The reason I would hold to, hold to the rapture at the beginning is all of what I've seen in First Thessalonians and many other places, okay? So what if you end up being wrong? No big deal. <laughs> Jesus is coming, and one day I'm going. If I'm on earth, I'll be going. If not, I'm already gone. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. Uh, it, as someone said, it, it'll all pan out in the end. Okay? Now, I don't view this, and I've tried to look at this from figurative and symbolic, and I just can't get it. So I'll be looking at this from a literal approach. Because I believe this is going to happen. Okay? I just, there, this is so graphic here. I just cannot see this not happening. Uh, and there's a lot of other people that hold that, like John MacArthur and David Jeremiah. So I'll, I'll ride on their coattails on that one. So uh, I'm in decent company there. So, uh, so we're going to look at it from a literal perspective tonight. So let's look at four important truths that highlight this significant time uh, during the tribulation. Number one, watch God's temple be rebuilt. Now, he says here, uh, go and measure the temple of God. Now, when this has been A.D. 95, John's on been exiled to the Isle of Patmos, there's no temple. There's no temple around. Now, the big thing is, the big plot of land where the Temple Mount is, uh, is a very prized possession today. Now, how many temples have there been? Well, there was Solomon's Temple. It was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylonian captivity in 587 B.C. Then there was a second temple uh, built by Zerubbabel. It was destroyed by Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 B.C., that was a dude, uh, basically he came in there, attacked them on Sabbath day, destroyed everything, said, you must worship me as God, uh, desecrated everything, and uh, sacrificed a pig on the altar, which you know was an ultimate no-no. Then there was a third temple, that was Herod's temple, that would have been the temple in Jesus' day. It was destroyed by the Roman general Titus in AD 70. There's all history to prove that, okay? Now there's going to be a fourth temple built, and it's going to be in the tribulation time. It's going to be desecrated by the Antichrist. And then also Ezekiel 40 through 47 says, hey, then there's going to be a millennial temple. This temple, during this tribulation, the Jews are going to regather in Israel, uh, and there'll be a temple. Now, is there any temple today? No. The only thing left is the Western Wall. And you see Jews go there all the time. What are they doing? They're praying and pouring out their hearts to God in anguish, and what are they asking for? The Messiah to come and the temple to be rebuilt. Unfortunately, the Messiah has already come. But that's the only thing left. If you go there today in Jerusalem, what is on what many think the Temple Mount? You got the Mosque of Omar. You got the Dome of Rock. The Muslims are there. That that is the most <laughs> debated, contested. Uh, there's been fights over that land. Now, what's interesting is uh, Dr. Asher Kaufman, who's a professor of physics uh, at the Hebrew University, revealed in the Biblical Archaeology Review, he says he thinks he's actually found the actual location of Solomon's and Herod's temple, which is pretty interesting, which is 26 meters away from the Dome of Rock, which means there's 
place to build a new temple. And actually, they, uh, the Jews, actually, they are uh, trying to train new priests and get ready for something like this. Now, the temple being built, you need to understand, is going to be a precursor to the Antichrist coming. That's Matthew 24. The temple is going to be built, and then here comes the Antichrist. He's going to come onto the scene. So let me give you two truths here. The temple will be under God's project, God's protection. Now, he gives uh, John this read, and he says, all right, now go out and measure. He, said, he gives him this kind of like hollow bamboo, bamboo-like cane, kind of like a measuring stick, uh, a yardstick. He says, now go measure the temple. Now, what's interesting, go and measure their commands. But he doesn't give us the measurements. What's he measuring for? I think he, what he's measuring for is because the word there, temple, is actually referring to the holy of holies and the holy place. It's not talking about the court of Gentiles. He's talking about the place where people would come in and worship. You need to understand this temple will be rebuilt with the permission of God, but it will be built under God's protection. It's going to be rebuilt. Number two, the temple is part of God's plan. It's part of God's plan because he says, hey, don't, he says, exclude the courtyard outside. Why? That's given to the, to the nations. It's given to the Gentiles. And what are the Gentiles eventually going to do? Come in with the Antichrist and says, hey, they're going to trample everything. They literally come in and trample everything. The Antichrist will desecrate this temple. Now look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. Look at what it says. It says, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. That's the Antichrist. And the man doomed to destruction. He exposes, he opposes and exalts himself above every so called God or object of worship. So that he what? He sits in God's temple proclaiming that he himself is God. So the Gentiles and the Antichrist are going to come in there. The Antichrist is going to come in. He's going to make a covenant with the Jews. Hey, you need to make allegiance with me. Hey, everything, so we can have peace and everything will be great. And they're going to make an allegiance with the Antichrist. And everything's going to go fine for a little while. They're going to do animal sacrifices. And then all of a sudden, the Antichrist is going to come in there, wipe them out, sit on the throne, and say, I am God, you must worship me. And that's what's called in Matthew 24, or you see it in scriptures, known as the abomination of desolation. He's going to come in and destroy stuff. There's going to be a temple rebuilt. So if you hear them getting ready to rebuild something in... Uh, Jerusalem, you might want to perk your ears up. <laughs> it might be getting close. Number two, second truth. Listen to how God's word will reverberate throughout the world. Listen to how God's word will reverberate throughout the world. Now, during this first three and a half years, God's going to have his prophets. We've all already seen in Chapter 7, 144,000 Jews get saved. Um, two more noted here. It says there's two amazing witnesses. And so let me give you two truths here. God's witnesses receive his power in verses 3 and 4. Now there's two witnesses. Now what do they do? They prophesy in sackcloth. What does that mean? That's just basically that would be a sign of repentance and humility they come mourning over the world's sin, and they're going to come calling people to repentance. They're prophets raised up by God, just like Elijah and Elisha and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. They spoke the word of God. How long will they speak the word of God? It says three and a half years. God gave them 42 months to accomplish their ministry. I think that's literal. Others would say that's symbolic. It'll be a short time. I don't know, but I'm going to go with three and a half years. Because I'm taking everything here literally, pretty much. Verse 4 is crucial because he, it looks like back to a vision of Zechariah 4, the olive trees provide oil for the lamps, 
A lampstand gives light, and together they do. They speak with the power of God. The oil would kind of be like the Holy Spirit, and they're going to come in boldly preaching the Word of God. Now, what could they do? Oh, wow. They were invincible. It says they could stop the rain. They could turn the waters into the blood. They could strike the earth with plagues. They, th when they come, they're not going to be preaching some mamby-pamby, woke, liberal theology. They're going to preach, repent, give your life to Christ. Judgment is around the corner, and if you don't give your life to Christ, you'll spend all eternity in hell. It will be not uh, a PCRC preaching. It'll be none of that. And they'll be hated for it. Will there be people who repent and be saved? Yes. Will there be many people that hate them? Oh, yes. Now, who are these guys? Good question. <laughs> Uh, some people think they represent the Old Testament, New Testament. Like I said, some say, hey, it represents the witnessing church. Others uh, would say Elijah and Enoch. Why Elijah and Enoch? Remember Enoch, very beginning. What did it talk about Enoch? Enoch and God were walking and... This is my paraphrase, okay? So they're walking and basically, they were closer to God's home than Enoch's, and God said, let's go home. And he took him home. How did Elijah go out? What? Chariots of fire. They, they did not die. Others think it's Elijah and Moses. Okay? Others think maybe Peter and Paul. Uh, there's all kinds it looks like more like to us, and maybe we're wrong because it looks too close like it, but it looks like Elijah and Moses to me. Uh, basically because Elijah was a prophet, Moses was a prophet. What did Elijah do? Prayed, and it didn't rain for how long? Three and a half years. What did Moses do? Turn the water into blood. What did Moses perform? What did uh, Moses uh, strike the earth with? Plagues. But Elijah never experienced death. Who was at the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, and Jesus? Elijah, Moses. He said, but Moses died. Mm hmm Do you know where his uh, gravesite is? No. Many tourists, when they go to Israel, they say, where's Moses buried? Because Moses is the dude. Moses is Savior to the Jews. He's Redeemer. Why? He brought them out of bondage. He took them through the water. They were redeemed by the blood of the Passover lamb, and then they were taken through the water which symbolizes really baptism. And so nobody knows where his... If they knew where he was buried, it would be the biggest tour site in the whole wide world. If they knew where Moses, the man who wrote first five books, the Bible, the Torah, oh, man, he would be... I mean, they would... I mean, you'd have to pay $100 or more to get into that place. So nobody knows where he's buried because God preserved his body. So no matter what, these two witnesses, they have powerful ministries. Second, God's witnesses receive his protection. Man, they're going to be protected. And uh, if you try to harm them, <laughs> um, if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. They have the authority. I mean, in the beginning, you're not going to be able to harm these dudes. And then verse 6 is, man, there's going to be misery on earth while they're there. Now their message, I don't like I said, I don't think it was, again, they were saying, hey, folks, judgment is just around the corner. 
all this stuff that you've been seeing doesn't look good. Who knows, maybe while they're there, third, you know, some of those seals and bowls and judgments have been going on. Hey, you, you saw all this happen, third the you know, stuff burned up. Hey, that means God's coming, you better give your life to Christ. And so God gives people an opportunity. But God had his hand on them. They were untouchable and unstoppable till it was time for their ministry to be an end. You need to understand, same is true for you and me. Same is true for God's church. What does the Bible say? The gates of hell should not prevail against my church. What does that mean? We're untouchable and unstoppable for the duration of whatever ministry God has for it. Untouchable, unstoppable. That means we can, whatever God wants us to do, we can accomplish it if we will follow Him and be about His ministry. Now, they didn't say you wouldn't face huh, persecution. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but if you get in line with God, You'll have the peace of God, and you'll be unstoppable. You'll be untouchable while you have the hand of God on you. And whatever comes to you, it has to come through God. Anything that comes, you need to understand, even right now, anything that comes into your life has got to come past God. And you're like, why did that come out? I don't like that. Well, God allowed it in your life. Trust him with it and quit worrying about it. Number three, third truth. You've got to understand that God's two witnesses will be rejected. They're going to come and preach boldly. There's going to be some people get saved, but they're going to be rejected. John 15, 18, through 18 and verse 20 says this. Just write it down. John 15, 18, and 20. Let me read it to you because I don't have it on the screen. It says, Jesus said this, If the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. And remember the word I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And if they kept my word, they will also keep yours also. After three and a half years of ministry, all of a sudden... God's two witnesses will discover the harsh reality of what he just said. You need to understand, the world hated Jesus, the world will hate you and me if we live for him. If the world likes you and speaks really, really well of you all the time, you're probably running in line with the world. Now, if you live boldly for Jesus... And you let your light so shine. Matthew, in the sermon, sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I think if you live for the Lord, there will actually be some loss of I, I don't like what he stands for, but he's real. But in this day, they ain't going to say that. When this day here, it's not going to be a pretty day. You need to understand two truths. God's witnesses will be killed. They finish the ministry God had for them, and they're killed. God's plan is coming to an end. And then it says what? The beast comes out of the abyss, where the worst of the demons are. This is the first of 36 references to the beast, and you know what it means. The beast refers to the Antichrist. Okay? He gets his power for Satan. He's possessed by Satan. He's... Uh, driven by Satan, uh, he's going to be an amazing leader, charismatic leader with lots of power, and many people will fall for him. It says here, it says, uh, their dead bodies will lie in the main street of the great city, which figuratively is called Sodom and Egypt, where also the Lord was crucified. Now, Sodom, I think, is referring to what had happened. This, this city had become a symbolic of vile immorality and wickedness. Egypt was a symbol a nation symbolic of oppression, slavery, and idolatry. And where did this take place? 
where also their Lord was crucified. Where's the Lord crucified? Jerusalem. So I think this is where it's going to take place. It'll all take place here in Jerusalem. So what does that mean? Jerusalem at that day is just going to be like every other wicked city in the world. And it's really going to be wicked at that time. Why will these two guys be killed? Because <clears throat> they preach God's word boldly and proclaim the gospel as the only way to get to God through Jesus Christ. They pro proclaim if you reject Jesus, you will spend eternity in hell. No ifs, ands, and buts. There will be no watered-down gospel. They will tell the word. And because of that, they're going to be treat treated in shame shameful fashion. But David Jeremiah said this, The man of God in the will of God is immortal until he has finished the work God has given him to do. These two witnesses come back for three and a half years. They're going to do, their, do the will of God, the ministry of God, and then bang. They will be killed. It says what? The Antichrist comes up out of the abyss, will make war on them, conquer them, and kill them. Now, we don't have that yet. Praise the Lord. But I'm not promising you we won't have that in a few years. Because um, it's coming more rapidly than you imagine, folks. Again, apart from a great revival in God's house, because God's people are half asleep in America, we will see the same thing in our country very, very soon. Especially if a bunch of woke idiots get in charge. It will happen. Didn't think I'd see it in my lifetime, but it's, it, it's, becoming, more, um, it's becoming more a reality every day. A few years ago, I used to say it and was like, yeah, that could happen. Now I'm thinking I think it's going to happen, possibly. Let me share one story of a guy who was a preacher. He was a, in Romania, and the communists were trying to kill him. His name was Pastor Joseph Son. He was a pastor. They wanted to kill him for preaching the gospel. And they sent word to Joseph. They said, hey, if you don't knuckle up and quit, knuckle under and quit, if you don't quit preaching the gospel, we're going to kill you. The reason I'm sharing this, I just want you to hear what he said. This is how Pastor Joseph responds. He says, before you kill me, I want to say that your chief weapon is killing. But my chief weapon is dying. They asked him, what do you mean by that, Joseph? He says, if you kill me, you will sprinkle every sermon I've preached with my blood, and people will know I love the Lord Jesus enough to die for him. So your chief weapon is killing me, but mine is dying. And because of that, the word will spread. And I want you to warn you that if you use yours, I'll be forced to use mine. As people left, said, that dude is crazy. And they, didn't, they left him alone. But 2 Timothy 3.12 tells us, Paul tells us, all who want to live a godly life, will be persecuted. So remember, as Christ followers, we're on the winning side. No matter how people come against us, what they say about us on social media, what they say about us out in the marketplace, how they tell lies about us and stuff, it don't matter. You live for Jesus, you preach the gospel, you share the gospel, you live for him, that's all that matters. These de this, the death of these two people, witnesses will make the antichrist all of a sudden popular all over the world so you need to understand god's witnesses will be hated they will be hated now what's amazing is i believe the whole world is going to now years ago we couldn't imagine this the whole world is going to see their bodies in the streets 
and they'll see it on a screen. Now, a few years ago, we couldn't have, 40 years ago, you couldn't have fathomed that. 20 years ago, you couldn't have fathomed that. Now, this is going all around the world if you want to watch it. So, yeah, you'll be able to see their bodies, and I, I believe this is going to be real. You see their bodies laying in the streets for three and a half days. Now, why would they do that? Because especially back then, that was, ooh, that was shameful humiliation to leave somebody's body in the street and not take it and go bury it somewhere. So I think they'll, hey, they'll see it everywhere. It says here in the text, they will do what? Verse 10, man, they will gloat, they will rejoice, they will party, they'll start sending gifts to one another, they'll actually create a new holiday. It'll be satanic Christmas. And that's what it says, right? Gloat, send gifts to one another. <coughs> the two prophets who tormented us, they're gone. Celebrate. Dead Witnesses Day. They'll have trees and lights. One writer described it like this. Now comes the real revelation of the heart of man. Glee, hard, insane, inhuman, hellish, ghoulish glee. There is actual delight at death of God's witness, utter unbounded delight. He said, that never happened. Didn't people celebrate when 9-11 happened on other parts of the world? Yeah. Now, these people will be celebrating in the streets, and then the Antichrist will spin the fake news because he'll have his Marxist mainstream media that we already have right now, and he'll use that to spread the news. That all this, these two witnesses, they were a bunch of, they were of, they were no good. He'll probably tell them that, that they were of the devil. Probably call them a bunch of racists and everybody will believe it. And so you got to understand, if you live for the Lord Jesus Christ, you just got to understand this, folks. And this is hard for people. I'm, this this is going to be hard. It does not mean everybody will love you or like you. You just got to get over that. Now, I'm not saying go up to people and tell them, you better turn to burn right now, buddy. No, have some love and say you need to give your life to Christ because if you don't give your life to Christ, you can experience and you will experience hell. But share it with them with love and compassion instead of <laughs> uh, hateful judgment. Everybody's not going to like you. Everybody's not going to love you. Let me just be honest with you. Everybody ain't going to like you even and love you even in the church today. Let's just be honest. I'm just going to be blunt honest here. So that will never happen to church. Well, you come and you stand on this side and you stand in this sacred desk and you preach God's word and you lead and you'll find out you'll be in the crosshairs and everybody won't like everything you say and do. That's in the house of God. That's just a little bit. Take that out in the world, and you start taking it to a lost and dying world. They're not going to like everything you say. Take that to Washington, D.C. Take that out to San Francisco and share it. See how many people like you. It ain't going to happen. Take that down into BLM Corner or Antifa. They ain't going to like that either. So just as my honor, just understand your identity is in Christ and not what people think about you see that's where you have to get to a point is that easy no I learned that through athletics not everybody's gonna like me as Christ follower it's not about who likes me it's about what Jesus thinks about me because I'm going to be accountable to him I'm not going to be accountable to this world 
So you just might better buck up and understand everybody's not going to like you. Live for Jesus, love people. If they hate you, love them. Because that's what, read the Sermon on the Mount. But just understand they're not going to like you. They're lost. Just understand that. Lost people are not going to like you if you get up in their grill and tell them, hey, if you don't give your life to Christ, you don't got no hope in this world. Got to move on because I'm about running out of time because that was a good preaching spot. Number four, let's move. No God always has the last word. All of a sudden, everybody, life's good, life's good, we're partying, bam, bam, they're dead. Oh, wow. They're going to realize, uh-oh, we're not in charge. Because God's getting ready to say, I'm fixing to turn out the lights, folks. Your party's over. So let me give you two truths very quickly here. God honors his servants. He honors his servants in verses 11 through 12. Uh, wow, I, I like this part here. Uh, I can, I don't know. I can envision this because now we live with screens. I can envision Fox News. And all, These two guys have been dead three and a half days. Let's party. Everybody send their gifts one another. Let's celebrate, celebrate. And they got, they've got the screens and they got the drones on them. They're watching them 24-7. And then, man, this, this, this would be awesome to see. Because all of a sudden, bam, God's going to breathe life into them. They're going to stand up on their feet. And then it says what? Great fear fell on those who saw them. So that means the whole world is going to see this pretty much. And this is the first of seven great fears in this chapter. And all of a sudden, what's going to happen? Voice from heaven says, come up here. And they're going to whoop. And they're going to be gone. And then everybody's going to go, uh-oh. But then second, God deals with sinners. And he records judgment on evil Jerusalem. It's, it's pretty amazing here. It says, that moment a violent earthquake took a tenth of the city and 7,000 people were killed. I think God takes out 7,000 people. I don't know who, but he knew who he was going to take out, and he took out 7,000 of them. Now, I want you to get this. Even in the midst of all this, Look at the response. The survivors were terrified and gave glory to God of heaven. MacArthur points out giving glory to God of heaven is a mark of genuine worship. And he goes on to say this passage described the reality of salvation of Jews in Jerusalem. Even in the midst of his wrath in dealing with sinners, what does he show them? I think he shows them grace and mercy. So even some will get saved here. Wow. I don't know about you, but I, I, if I just saw those two dudes, I know they were the preachers of God's word and the gospel, and then God resurrected them up and took them to heaven, I think I might be thinking about giving my life to Christ too. <laughs> Especially when an earthquake came. Uh-oh, Lord. I, there's going to be saying, oop. I heard them, I'm giving my life to Christ. And so even during the time of judgment, God offers grace. And I think God offers grace up to the end. Will there be many more people saved in that last part of the judgment? Probably not as we've talked about because you're going to have to have the mark to worship. I mean, you're going to worship the beast and there's just not, you're not going to be able to survive. You probably, if you do get saved, you're not going to be around long. Just do you'll get killed or you won't be able to survive. And so, amazing text. 
a lot there. Let me give you four points of application, and I'm wrapping this thing up. Because, again, we want to remind you, the people of God will exist at all times, speak the word of God at all times. Number one, four keys that we get out of this. Number one, give your life to Christ. If you're online with me and you don't know Jesus Christ, you need to repent of your sins, call on the name of Jesus, ask him to save you. Say, Lord, I'm tired of going my way. I'm ready to follow you. You need to understand, give your life to Christ. Number two, share the gospel and pray for the gospel to preach for the whole world, to the whole world. You need to pray that God's word would be preached prophetically and boldly and powerfully all around the world so people could hear the gospel. So they wouldn't have to be on this day that they might come to know Christ. Number three, this is fast. These are bullet points and they're very fast. God is always at work. And sometimes suffering is part of his plan. Sometimes suffering will be part of his plan. Okay, he's always at work. But sometimes it'll be suffering. And then last, uh, this truth that Coach Fields gave us, live this day in light of that day. Live this day in light of that day is the fourth bullet point. We need to live with the end in sight. Why? Because he's coming back someday. Live today, not promise tomorrow. If we get tomorrow, live for him that day. But live in light of that day because one day he is coming back. Now praise the Lord. Again, depending on where you fall out, you could be here at this time or you could not be here at this time. I hope I'm in heaven and I get to see the highlights. But no matter what, we're to proclaim his word till he comes. He will come one day. And it's going to be an amazing day. But till then, let's pray many come to know him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for your gospel. And Lord, I know this is a graphic chapter that you've given us in Revelation. But, Lord, we do know there will be one day uh, that your gospel will be proclaimed and many will not receive it. But, Father, till that time, Lord, we pray for the gospel to spread. We pray for our nation which desperately needs the gospel. And, Lord, help us to be bold witnesses for you. Forgive us when we're not, Lord. But, Lord, help us to live every day for you in light of that one day that you're coming back. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of the week. Um, again, Sunday, we'll have service 10 a.m. here. We'll be online also. Uh, we're in the series, The Gift of God. If you haven't seen last week's message, you need to get it before you get for the next one. But we'll be looking at the gift of acknowledgment this Sunday, the gift of acknowledgement. Very good text. Um, people don't know Christ, uh, invite them to come in or watch uh, because it's a powerful text. So hope you all have a great night. God's blessings on you. See you Sunday. Bye.